this morning. God is good and his mercy endures forever. Thank you Kim and the team. Y'all did an amazing job this morning. Hallelujah. We've had church already. If you got your Bibles, let's get them in your hands. We're going to have our confession. Say, this is my Bible. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. I can be who it says I can be. My mind's alert. My heart's receptive to receive the uncompromised, the unchanging, the infallible seed of the Word of God. For well, this is God's Word speaking to me, and I'm going to be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. You may be seated if you can. Praise your holy name. We got some good things lined up, and please get on board. Before we get started, let me ask, is there anyone visiting here for the first time? I think my wife made one tiny mistake this morning. She forgot the visitors. One visitor, thank you so much for being here. God bless you. You got information to them? Make sure you get that, fill it out, and we'll get some stuff to you. But thank you for being here and choosing Victory Life. Thank all of you for being here. And trusting us to give you the uncompromised word of God. Hallelujah. Well, we've been talking about attitude, the power of attitude. And how our attitude does make a difference. It makes a big difference. And we get influenced in our attitude in different ways. We get influenced in people in general. We get influenced in coworkers. We get influenced in social media. We get influenced in television. Um, we get influenced in uh, mostly, uh, probably a big part of our influence attitude is through our spouse. So you should be an influence over your spouse. Your attitude should influence your spouse. So you be careful what you say to your spouse and be careful how you treat your spouse, how you act towards them. Amen? So it's important that we keep a good attitude. And the more I dive into this, the more I understand how important our attitude is in our walk with Christ. Because our attitude towards Him determines his attitudes towards us. And we're going to talk about this biblically and scripturally, and, uh, but uh, we're going to answer some questions this morning. But it's, it's good to have a great attitude. One of the greatest limiters or releasers of your potential in life is your attitude. You've heard me say this many times before. Your attitude is what determines your achievement. Amen? A lot of you know I was a coach. I coached baseball and football, my, both two of my boys growing up. And you can always tell the ones that wanted to be there. The attitude of the ones that wanted to be there, the attitude wanted to work hard, yes, sir, yes, coach, they were contributors on the team. The ones that didn't want to be there made excuses for why they didn't want to do something, didn't contribute to the team a lot. So I want to encourage you this morning to be a contributor in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Be a contributor in the kingdom of heaven. And we showed you some things this morning through our announcements and see fan how we can contribute to the kingdom we're called not just to be spectators but we are to be participators in the kingdom and it's how you're and what, what attitude you determine to have because you can decide your attitude towards this is whether you're going to participate or not i wouldn't plan on saying all that but is it's uh, but your attitude there is a direct connection between your faith and your attitude there's a direct correlation between your faith and your attitude. James 1 verse 2 of the New Living Translation says this. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. When tests and trials come, it's how you respond to it. We said this many, I've said this a couple times now. Life is about 10% what happens to you. 90% of life is how you react to it. So your attitude makes a big difference in how your life goes. But James wrote this verse during a time where the Christians had allowed themselves, they were, they, they were frustrated, they were being annoyed in life situations, because you got to understand, when James wrote this, uh, Christians were heavily persecuted. 
Many Christians were being killed, murdered. They were being locked up in prison just because of their faith in Christ. You know, we think, oh, things are getting bad now. Things, uh, 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 but back then, you were getting killed for your, person, for your faith. You were getting locked up for your faith. Many people were scared. They was, they was leaving their homes because they was afraid. A lot of them didn't have a lot of food to eat. They was hungry. And, uh, but I'm telling you, their attitude made all the difference. And that's why James was saying, this is what you want to do. Consider it an opportunity for great joy. You know, a lot of us watch television a lot. and Some of us watch more than we should. But uh, the news, if you keep an eye on the news, it's going to keep you discouraged. It's going to keep you in a negative mindset. A negative mindset ends up being a bad attitude. You don't, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is don't look at things that are happening in the world and then complain about it. A lot of people do that. They want to watch TV, they want to watch Fox, they want to watch CNN, they want to see what's going on, and then they want to complain about it. That keeps you in the wrong mindset. Look at the good side. You know, that's being a pessimist. An optimist is looking to see what the good part of life is. No, well, the good thing about life is revival is coming. Yeah. And revival has already started. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The Bible says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Jesus said, I, at the end times, I'm pouring out my spirit on all flesh. Yeah. So we win in the end. Yeah. So don't get discouraged about how things are looking in the natural. You don't live by what you can see. You live by what you can't see. Right. I'm getting ahead of myself. Right. Hallelujah. But we, um, you know... We, we, we have the tendencies, even though we're not persecuted the way maybe they were back then, we still go through tests and trials. We still get times that we can, or opportunities that we can get discouraged. People get on our nerves, don't they get on our nerves? Coworkers can get on our nerves, friends can get on, family can get on your nerves. We know that. So but we have to maintain the right attitude even when those times happen. Are you with me? Your finances don't always support you, and your health seems to fail you sometimes. But your attitude is your choice. Thank God for Pam and Cynthia this morning. They're here today, and they lost a young man that really is gone too soon. That's a good way to say it. They're, uh, Cynthia's grandson and um, Pam's nephew, a young man, there's no reason for him to be out of this world or taken out at this age. But you know what? It's an opportunity for them to experience joy during this situation. What God meant for, what the devil meant for bad, God can turn it around for good. We pray that souls will be changed, lives will be changed, souls will be saved during this ordeal while this young man is not with us today. Amen. And a lot of times you heard me say, you ain't going to understand everything. This is one of those things that you don't understand why things happen in life. God didn't have anything to do with taking him on, but he's gone now. But you don't focus on why or how this happened. You trust God no matter what. Are you with me? I say you trust God no matter what. Hallelujah. But your attitude is your choice. Whatever circumstance I face, it does not have the power to dictate my attitude. It doesn't have the power to dictate my attitude. William James, an American psychologist, he, he said it this way. The greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes. Amen? So you can alter your life by altering your attitude. Attitude defined, I like this one of the definitions of attitude, is a mental state relative to what we believe, and it affects our entire lives. You see the, you, you see the, uh, the simplicity or the uh, similarity between faith and attitude? We express our attitude in words and actions the same way we express faith. Faith is expressed through our words and our actions. So is attitude. You express your attitude through your words and your actions. But the difference between optimists and pessimists, optimists see, tend to see obstacles as opportunities. Optimists who expect good things to happen will take action that leads to good things happening to them. Optimists are like um, uh, magnetics. They attract good things. When you look for good things to happen to you and you expect good things to happen to you, guess what? Good things will happen to you. Amen. But it's the same thing with your negative mindset. 
if you have a bad attitude and you're pessimist and you always seem to see the, the, the negative and the bad in life or the bad in your situation, you pick out what's wrong, a lot of times it attracts things that go wrong in your life. So we have to make sure that as children of God, we should have the most optimistic attitude there is. Amen? Amen. John Ron says, attitude is greatly shaped by influence and association. So your attitude is influenced by people you hang out with. So you got to be careful who you choose to hang out with. Somebody look to your neighbor and say, are, are you okay? <laughs> Miss you up there this morning. I see you on stage. Hallelujah. You was up there? Oh, okay. Y'all sounded good this morning. I know that. Didn't the band do a wonderful job this morning? Hallelujah. Yeah, we were excited about our singers and band. They usher in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Man, it was here early this morning worshiping God, and I'll tell you, it makes a big difference. Don't it? Hallelujah. But your attitude are greatly influenced by association. Who you hang out with, that makes a big difference. You can choose to hang out with people that's going uh, to be discouraging, that's going to be uh, not challenging, but I choose to hang out with people that's going to motivate me. That's going to encourage me. I don't like hanging around negative folk. I don't like hanging around people that's always sad and complaining about something that's going on with them. You know, I know some, I got family members that always got something going on. Always, they always got something going on. And, you know, I like to hang around people that's, that's going places and that are upbeat and positive about life. There's a simple scripture in Proverbs 13, 20 says that whoever, whoever, if I say whoever, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. It makes a difference who our companions are. According to Scripture, good companions are those who have wisdom. When we choose to associate ourselves with wise men and women, guess what? We become wise. It rubs off on us. I mean, I like how the, the Passion Translation says it this way. If you want to grow in wisdom, spend time with the wise. If you walk with the wicked, you eventually become just like them. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory. Charles Swindle wrote a wonderful paragraph about attitude in his book. And his book was called Strengthening Your Grip. And it says this, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past. It is more important than education. It is important than money. It is more important than circumstances, than failures, than successes. It's more important than what other people think or what other people say or do. It is more important than appearances, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, or a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the people. I mean, the fact that people will act in a certain way. And you've heard me say this more than once. I live by a motto. You have no control over. I mean, don't worry about things you have no control over. Are you with me? Don't worry about things you have no control over. But we really do have a choice about our attitude. Our attitude determines, or let me say this, our attitude can influence us or it can hinder us through our walk with Christ. I proved this to you. The children of Israel, when they was led out of the wilderness of Israel, many miracles will happen. They, God fed them. He took care of their needs. But they still were complainers. They still wanted to go back to the slave aspect. They didn't want to be around the wilderness. They didn't want to go to the... Well, they didn't act like they wanted to go to the promised land. They had bad attitudes. They kept complaining, kept complaining. Everything Moses was doing, they complained about it. Why is this happening? Why? I'm tired of man. I'm tired of quail. I want something different. They always complained about it. Now, God had promised them the promised land. He promised them the land of milk and honey. He promised them that. But guess what? That generation didn't ever see the promised land because of their attitude. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. It was because of their attitude is the reason that generation didn't see the promised land. So their attitude, what, what I'm trying to say is, their attitude changed the promise of God. In other words, God changed his mind based on their attitude. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? 
Are you with me this morning? I'm not going to tell you the story. I did a couple stories this Wednesday night about the difference between the attitude. Had two people, to, I'll just paraphrase it. Had two people come to church. One came to church and was critical to pick out everything he didn't like. The pastor said something he didn't, he, he had a slip of the tongue. He, wasn't, he didn't like that. He didn't like some of the songs that were being sung. He, he snuck out the side door doing communion. He thought, said, why do I bother to come? I didn't even like service. The same, same church service, a different guy come to the same service, and he started picking out things that he liked about the service. He started picking out uh, a, a man uh, holding his kid, hugging his children, taking him to the children's church. He started liking the songs that were being sung. The, the minister, the pastor preached a sermon that was right on time that he was dealing with something in his life. And he said, man, it's good to come to the house of God and see the presence of the Lord. So it's your attitude this morning that you're going to be receptive or not. You can be the same way. You can be critical of the service this morning, or you can receive what God has for you to receive this morning. In other words, cultivate an attitude of optimism. Cultivate. What does that mean? Cultivate, a couple definitions, means try to acquire or develop. When you cultivate something... You work to make it better. Amen. So my, my message today is, even though you have a good attitude, your attitude can be better than what it is. Ask your spouse that. Can my attitude be better than what it is? <laughs> some, <laughs> some of you are so mad with each other, you didn't even look at them. <laughs> you better change your attitude. I'm telling you, you want to change your marriage, you better change your attitude. <laughs> Hallelujah. But anticipate the best outcome. Amen? You know, life is short. Man, I was thinking when they were doing announcements, oh, my goodness, we're almost six months into 2023. Almost, camp meetings right us almost top of us. I mean, we scheduled church at the beach. I think it was last year, wasn't it? We started first talking about it. And now it's coming up on us, you know, I'm like, wow, times are quick, times are changing. But life is short. No matter how long you live, life is short. So I'm going to live the best that I can live for Jesus Christ. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's go to verses uh, 8 and 9. You want to talk about a man that had a positive attitude. Paul was a man that had a positive attitude. And we can learn a lot from Paul's examples in his life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Paul said, We are hard-pressed on every side. Yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. In other words, Paul had a, he had an answer for everything. He had a positive answer for everything. Paul, didn't have, Paul spent seven, seven and a half years of his life in bars, in prison, behind bars. He was locked up for seven, seven and a half years of his life but just because he was a man of God. Because he preached the gospel. He got locked up for that. But it didn't, it didn't discourage him from doing what God had called him to do. Amen? This is here that we are hard-pressed on every side. Paul was hard-pressed, and he knew what hard-pressed meant. Hard-pressed meant having difficulties doing something. And also means closely pursued, which is related to the idea of being hunted. And I researched this, and I found out, and I had forgotten I had read it before, but Paul was actually at one time a hunted man. People wanted to kill Paul. Let's go to Acts chapter 23. Some people think they got it bad today. Well, let's look at, look, look at Paul's situation. That's part of, uh, Acts chapter 23 verse 12 says this, And when it was day, some of the Jews handed together and bound themselves under an oath, saying, which was a promise, so, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Number 13, now there were more than 40 who had formed this com conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will not eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now, I don't have time, but if you go on and read the rest of Acts, it explains all the, the turmoil that Paul went through. But God orchestrated pieces in his life to keep them from killing him. 
And one of those pieces was it was a shipwreck. It ends up, you remember, you know the story about Paul and the shipwreck. They was locked up. He was headed to Rome because he, he had found favor with the Caesar. So Caesar actually got him out of the situation where the 40 men were going to kill him. But anyway, when he was going to shipwreck, the, the boat sank. And Paul told him, the boat's going to sink, God. This, this is not a good idea to go to Rome right now. And they didn't listen to him. But while they was going to Rome in the boat, wind came up, storm came up. And the boat was tossed to and fro, and it shattered. But Paul said before that, no one, the boat's going to be destroyed, but no one will lose their life. And that's exactly what happened. The boat destroyed, no one lost their life. And they sailed on, and they made it to Malta, I think it was. And, of course, and when Malta, Paul ended up preaching the gospel in Malta. So God orchestrated things in his life. Why? Because God, Paul had a great attitude. He knew, and no matter what he went through, Paul knew that he was going to come out an overcomer. Are you with me this morning? But Paul knew what it was like being a hunted man. And uh, can you imagine the stress if you knew that 40 men were coming to kill you? That would be kind of hard to deal with if, if 40 men were coming to kill you. Amen? But Paul's victory was secured and accomplished only through his attitude. Life may knock us down sometimes, but it has not knocked us out. Paul is reminding us that quitting as far as being a Christian, is not an option for the people of God, regardless of what is thrown at us. No matter what you're going through, no matter what Satan throws at you, no matter what life throws at you, you are not going to quit. You're not going to get knocked out. You may get knocked down, but you can get right back up. I say you may get knocked down, but you can get right back up. Jesus reminds us in John 16, 33, Jesus reminds us that in this world we will have trouble, but be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen? Amen. I said, I have overcome the world. Amen. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Everybody say, something good, something good. is about to happen. Hallelujah. That's the mindset you got to stay on. Something good is about to happen. No matter what comes your way, you got to say, well, something good is about to happen. Hallelujah. Philippians 2, 14 and 15 says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We are living now in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And I know you already know that. So we should let our light shine. Amen? That means we, to let our light shine is we don't complain about things that are happening. It's a natural response to see negative news on TV and complain about it. Are y'all with me this morning? But the Word says don't complain about it. Just pray. It's an opportunity to pray. We've got plenty to pray about in this society this day and time. So be children of God. Be a good people with a good attitude and pray about things amen but people that complain live by what they can see that's what the world does they they live by what they can see they live by how they feel they live by what they want to do when they want to do it but we christians we live by faith and faith is something you can't see in the natural the bible says walk by faith and not by sight so live by what you can't see live by faith don't live by sight that's the difference between the world and us but we are going to let our attitude affect the world in these last days. The more we respond and make choices by faith, the more it will become natural for you. This is the only way our faith is perfected and grows to become proven faith that is more precious than gold. 1 Peter, 6 and 7, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 says this, In, in, the, uh, in this you greatly rejoice. In what? In your tests and your trials. You greatly rejoice. Now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now how is gold refined? It is, it is refined by fire. And the final phase of production involves removing impurities that remain after the smelting process the gold is liquefied in a furnace 
Borax and soda ash are added to the molten metal, which separates the pure gold from other precious and less precious metals. This is the point. The same way the genuineness of our faith is refined by testing trials. The same way gold goes through a process and it comes out pure gold is the same way the genuineness of our faith is refined by tests and trials. It is the testing that proves the value of the product. Are you with me? It is the testing that proves the value of the product. So the strength and value of your faith is proven by the tests and trials you go through. Are y'all, that's, what, that's what the scripture says, right? The strength and value of your faith is proven by the tests and trials you go through. I remember back in the old days when mom and dad, they were young in faith. They were real young. and They got a hold of faith, but they were young in it. And they thought everything that happened to me, God was trying to show them something. <laughs> that, that's true. That, that, I hadn't preached that in a while, but they did. I, I was kind of a wild child. I was kind of a daredevil, evil Knievel. I, I, didn't, I wasn't afraid of anything. And so I got hurt a lot. And I had to go to the hospital a lot. I had to get stitches a lot. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't think this face had a lot of stitches, but I had a lot of stitches growing up. But, but they, would th- they would pray. They what in the world, God? What are you trying to show? They would think, and that was just ignorance going to see. You know, they, they, that's not true. God doesn't, that's not the way God works. God doesn't work through that. But anyway, I thought it was kind of interesting. That it, but anyway, there was a lot of times they had to pray about uh, how I ended up getting hurt. And it, there was a lot of... I'll tell you one of the things is I got, I got uh, my mama was, uh, she was practicing, uh, singing the gospel, singing halos. She used to be in a singing group. Some of you know that. And uh, they would go around, they practice at these auditoriums. And uh, there was, a, I don't know why there was a lady there. I don't know. She wasn't part of the singing group. And she was trying to catch her dog. And, of course, I was, you know, I was going to help her. I went to try to help her catch her dog. And I, I think I, ca- I caught the dog, but it wasn't I was so much catching me. I put down, and he come to me, and he ripped my eye. I don't, he, I don't know if he bit me or he scratched me, but uh, he ripped my eye pretty open. My eyeball was hanging down, the skin coming down. But anyway, when I got to the hospital, the doctor didn't want to work on it. He said, I've never done this surgery right here close to the eye before. And, and Dad said, well, you do the surgery, and I'll pray. So, But anyway, you know, we can get... We can get spiritually numb or spiritually, I shouldn't say spiritually dumb, but spiritually dumb thinking that God uses things like that to make a point. That's not, that's not what happened. That's not the way God works. Amen? I don't know where I was at anyway. We're talking about tests and trials. We're talking about the value of your faith is proven by tests and trials. So I'm here today because I went through a lot of tests and trials. <laughs> I'm trying to tie this in somehow. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let me, let me talk about this. Automobile manufacturers maintain test tracks where they test new models and designs. A test track is like a racetrack. When a company designs a new engine, for example, it builds a prototype and then mounts that prototype into a test car. A test driver employed by the company takes the test car onto the test track and puts the new engine through its test, through the paces. The engineers and the company executives want to make sure that the engine can perform to its design perimeters. The test driver will stress the engine and press it to its maximum 180 miles per hour. If the speedometer says 180 miles, they want to make sure that, that's, that the car will go 180 miles. But let's say it keeps there for a certain period of time. Now, it might not be 180, it might be 100 miles an hour. But whatever the car is designed to do, they will test that engine to make sure that that car can do what it says it can do. Are y'all with me? So the prototype engine, if it fails the test, then they start over. But if it passed the test, then they say, okay, we can make more engines of the same prototype. They don't have to, they don't have to test every engine. They just make the same engine in, they make the engine in the image of its prototype. Are you with me? So it is the testing that proves the value of the product. Same way with our faith. You know, you don't say, well, what I do wrong? I, that was my point a while ago. When you, something comes against you, when you get a test, when you get a trial, when someone gets sick in your family, it ain't something that you did wrong. It's just an opportunity 
for your faith to grow and be tested. Does that make sense? So it is the testing that proves the value of your faith. So don't get discouraged because you're going through a test. The Bible says rejoice greatly when you're going through a test. It's, it's, a, it's not a natural thing to do, but it's a supernatural thing to do. Amen? amen. I said amen. amen. Let's go to John chapter, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. First John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Now, by this we know that we know him. Who is him? Jesus. If we keep his commandments, we know by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a what? And the truth is not in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. The evidence of someone knowing God and truly fellowshipping with God is the ones that keep his commandments. You know what scripture says? There's a big difference between knowing about Christ and knowing Christ. Are y'all with me this morning? You can know about people, but it's a difference in knowing you know about you know about a lot of you know popular athletes, uh, businessmen, senators, presidents, vice presidents. You know about them, but you don't know them. See, a lot of a lot of people are confused. Not very life people. A lot of people are confused because they know about Christ, that they're saved and they're going to heaven because they know about Christ. But you got to know Christ. Just knowing about Christ will never get you to heaven. But when you know Christ, you will trust in Him. And when you trust in Him, you will abide in Him and keep His commandments and walk just as He walked. Hallelujah. Now, we're not called to imitate the way Jesus walked on water. <laughs> That'd be nice, though, wouldn't it? We're called to walk as he walked on this earth. Yes, Listen to this. The spiritual power and authority that flowed out of Jesus came from a faithful, righteous, and disciplined life of fellowship with his Father. Amen. I'm going to say that again. Make sure you get it. The spiritual power and authority that, that God walked in, and Jesus, I mean, that Jesus walked in. It flowed out of Jesus. It came from a faithful, righteous, and disciplined life of fellowship with the Father. Yes, See, we, we seem to think that, okay, Jesus was the Son of God. He came down the earth, and he had special benefits. Jesus came down the earth as a Son of Man. That's why he went through, he was birthed just like we were. He came as a Son of Man. He was still tempted he didn't come. He didn't get a, a hall pass from being tempted. He was still tempted like you and I. He didn't give any temptation. He, and he didn't give any because he knew who Jesus was. He knew who his father was. He knew who his father was. He didn't know about his father. He knew his father. I'm telling you this morning, know who your father is. Know who your father is. Hallelujah. In order to do this, in order to have the same power and authority, we have to have the same mindset of Christ. We have to think like Christ. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2, and I'll explain this to you. Philippians chapter 2 in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind means that it is something that we have a choice about. Let this mind be in you. That's our decision. That's our choice. Let means to allow. Allow his mind to be in us. 
it's a choice that we have to make. We have to let it be so. We have to allow his mindset to be in us. What mindset? What attitude? Let's look in first, uh, let's look in first verse one, same chapter two, verse one. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Being like-minded means have the same attitude. Are y'all with me? Amen. Have the same attitude. Be like-minded. Have the same attitude. Fellowship comes from an ancient Greek word, kononio, K-O-N-O-N-I-O, I mean N-I-A. It means sharing of things in common. In other words, we share the life of Christ. We share the Spirit of God in us. We share that. Are you with me? We share that. Being like-minded, be comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. This is the attitude, the mindset of Christ. Fulfillment, my joy, my being like-minded, having the same love, being in one accord, and of one mind. And one mind. Number three, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Yes. Number four, verse four. Let each of you look not out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And in verse five, let this mind be in you. That's the mind of Christ. That's the attitude of Christ. Are you, are you here? Yes. Consolation in Christ, comfort of love, Fellowship of and with the Spirit, affection and mercy, all these should be the spiritual attributes of your attitude. Amen. Because it was the spiritual attributes of Christ's attitude. Let me say that again. Comfort of love, fellowship of the Spirit, affection and mercy, love, all of these should be the spiritual attributes of your attitude. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Let this mind be in you. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you, um, I'm, I'm gonna give you a, a story. I'm going to close with this. This is a story of a man named Jerry. It demonstrates the importance of our attitude. This, I got this from a, well, I got it online, but this was from a, a lady named Francie. I guess, Baltazar and Schwartz, and it was entitled, she wrote the book called Entitled, Attitude is Everything. It's a true story. Jerry was the kind of guy you love to hate. He was always in a good mood and always had something positive to say. When someone would ask him how he was doing, he would reply, if I were any better, I would be twins. He was a unique manager because he had several waiters who had followed him around from restaurant to restaurant. The reason the waiters followed Jerry was because of his attitude. He was a natural motivator. If an employee was having a bad day, Jerry was there telling the employee how to look on the positive side of that situation. Seeing this style really made me curious. So one day I went up to Jerry and asked him, I don't get it. You can't be a positive person all of the time. How do you do it? Jerry replied, each morning I wake up and say to myself, Jerry, you have two choices today. You can choose to be in a good mood or you can choose to be in a bad mood. I choose to be in a good mood. Each time something bad happens, I can choose to be a victim or I can choose to learn from it. I choose to accept their, comp I choose to learn from it. Every time someone comes to me complaining, I can choose to accept that complaining or I can point out the positive side of life to them. I choose to point out the positive side of life. Yeah, right. It's not that easy, I protested. Yes, it is, Jerry said. Life is all about choices. When you cut away all the junk, every situation is a choice. You choose how to react to situations. You choose how people will affect your mood. You choose to be in a good mood or a bad mood. The bottom line, it's your choice how you live your life. 
I reflected on what Jerry said. Soon thereafter, I left the restaurant industry to start my own business. We lost touch, but I often thought about him when I made a choice about life instead of reacting to it. Several years later, I heard that Jerry did something you're never supposed to do in a restaurant business. He left the back door open one morning and was held up at gunpoint by three armed robbers. While trying to open the safe, his hand shaking from nervousness slipped off the combination. The robbers panicked and shot him. Luckily, Jerry was found relatively quickly and rushed to the local trauma center. After 18 hours of surgery and weeks of intensive care, Jerry was released from the hospital with fragments of the bullet still in his body. I saw Jerry about six months after the accident. When I asked him how he was doing, he replied, If I was any better, I'd be twins. He said, that's not the end of the story. He said, want to see my scars? And, of course, she said, no, I, I declined to see his wounds. But did ask him what had gone through his mind as the robbery took place. He said, the first thing that went through my mind was that I shouldn't have left the door open. <laughs> and then as I lay on the floor, I remember that I had two choices. I could choose to live or I could choose to die. He said, I chose to live. Weren't you scared? Did you lose consciousness? Jerry continued, the paramedics were great. They kept telling me I was going to be fine. But when they wheeled me into the emergency room, I saw the expressions on the faces of the doctors and nurses. I got really scared, to be honest. In their eyes, I read, he is a dead man. I knew I needed to take action. What did you do, he asked. He said, well, there was a big burly nurse shouting questions at me. She asked if I was allergic to anything. And he said, yes. I said, yes, he replied. The doctors and nurses stopped working as they waited for my reply. I took a deep breath and yelled, bullets. <laughs> Over their laughter, I told them, I am choosing to live. Operate on me as if I'm alive and not dead. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jerry lived thanks to the skill of his doctors, but also because of his amazing attitude. I learned from him that every day we have the choice to live fully. After all, attitude is everything. Amen. Let's all stand this morning. Hallelujah. Now, it's easy to have a good attitude in church. All y'all did real good this morning. <laughs> so you got no excuses. This afternoon, when you got a chance to somebody get on your nerves, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Keep a good attitude. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.